In this video, I wanted to show you how to practice a Bach invention. And the example I'm going to use is the C major invention. So inventions were, Bach wrote, he's a Baroque composer, um, lived uh, 1600 to 1750. And the inventions are basically, he wrote 15 of them, and they basically use double counterpoint. So what is counterpoint? Counterpoint is where you have two independent lines kind of interweaving um, between each other. And it's a more complex texture than if you were to listen to like a chordal music or where, you know, it's like um, homophonic uh, music. Polyphonic music has multiple lines. So you can think of like multiple melodies that you have to listen to and uh, it just makes the texture kind of more, more interesting and also a little more difficult to listen to. So Bach wrote 15 inventions, and then he also wrote 15 symphonia, which are basically inventions but for three voices. Okay, so let's take a look at the invention uh, C major. So the first thing I like to do is I kind of, I like to analyze the piece first because it's going to help you when you are playing this because otherwise it's just going to sound like an exercise and you're not going to really see the beauty in the inventions. So when I was a kid and I was playing these, I just kind of learned, just learned all the notes and I didn't really see the, you know, the, the, how the idea came from the motives and how, or from the one motive, right? Because inventions usually use one motive and they derive all the material off of that one motive. That's really the amazing thing about the Bach inventions. So if you don't really understand, you know, all the material that was created off of that one motive, you're not going to really appreciate it. So let's start. So in C major, you have this motive. Okay, and it gets repeated and then the left hand. And then the second measure, you have that same motive up on the dominant. And then the left hand. A little bit different, but we still consider it the motive. So I would go through the whole piece and just see where all the motives show up just in their most original form. They might be transposed, but try to see if you can pick out, you know, where the motive shows up. So measure three, you have um, the motive, but inverted. And then again. Again. Um, and then measure, let's see, you have the motive again, measure five in G major. And then uh, four, five, six. Okay, actually that's a, that's a inverted subject fragment. And then again. And then here you are actually, um, this is where we have a modulation to the dominant key. So measure seven, you have a subject in G major. And, and then again in the right hand. A little bit different, but we're still counting it. It's still the motive, it's just slightly different. Again, in the left hand, measure eight, and then in the right hand. All right, and then measure nine, so you have the subject, or sorry, you have the motive, but it's been inverted. And then again in the right hand. And then measure 10, same thing, so you have the motive inverted. So you kind of get the pattern. This motive just gets recycled and transformed throughout this whole piece. Um, so you want to go through the whole thing and really look at where is the motive, where is it being transformed, how is it being transformed. So. I actually made another video where I analyzed this whole thing and I use the term subject and it's really the motive um, that it's called, this, this thing, this uh, 16th note figure. Um, and then even the other stuff that you think is not related to, to the motive, is it actually is related to the motive. So um, you might see like a fragment, like measure four. So you could say that that's a motive fragment, like the first four notes, but slowed down. So we call that augmentation. Um, and then also, so the next step, after you've kind of picked out all the different motives and how they've transformed in the invention, uh, start to look at where you have the cadences. Because usually, typically, 
in a major invention, you will modulate to the dominant key and then you will go through some sequences and cadences and then end up back in the tonic key. So I start on C major, I modulate to G major, and then do some sequences and cadences, and then I come back to the key of C major. This one, however, moves to uh, the relative minor at measure 15. So we have a cadence. Uh, so now I'm in A minor. So, I mean, not all inventions are going to follow this. And then if you're in a minor key, it's going to modulate to the relative major. So, but you definitely, for major inventions, you will modulate to the dominant. So that happens in measure four, five, six. Measure seven, you have a cadence and you go to G major. And then the last two measures, you have your cadence back in your tonic key. So yeah, so once you have that down, then I would start to learn each of the motives and just get comfortable, you know, the first one. And then do it all on the left hand as well. And you'll notice that the, the last note of the motive is kind of the goal. So it's like you want your notes to kind of have this momentum going towards that last note. So should be your goal note. So I'm seeing a lot of these motives, the last note ends on the first beat of the next bar. So you want to think of beat number one as the end of phrases, right? Usually when you cadence, you are doing the five chord and then the one chord ends on the downbeat of the next bar. So you want to make beat number one or that, that last beat, that last note of your motive, the goal note. Okay. So once you've done that, you know, you've kind of played through all the motives and all their transformations, then I would start playing hands separately. So um, one at a time. You could, you could actually start, you know, right hand play the motive, and then left hand, and then right hand. actually kind of stopping at the downbeat at the end of the phrase um, and that helps to remind me that I need to go have that keep that momentum uh, moving forward I don't want to just kind of stagnate right I want to move it forward and then left hand right hand, whatever hand, you know, one at a time so I can clearly hear the motive. Um, after that, then you can try playing the right hand by itself, the whole thing. And I actually do it without the ornaments. So ornaments you want to add last. Basically, these were probably done on a, on a keyboard instrument. The piano had been invented not until much later in Bach's life. So the texture, the articulation that we want to play. With 16th notes, you generally want to keep those smooth and connected. And with the eighth notes, those can kind of be detached, okay? Now, I've, I've heard from different teachers like, oh, with Bach, you don't really have any rules. You can kind of interpret it how you want. Some people are anti-using pedal. Some people are for using pedal. And I tend to not like to use pedal with Bach just because I want to kind of preserve this uh, kind of percussive feel that the, that the harpsichord has. At the same time, I think that Bach was hearing harmony when he wrote this. He was hearing the smoothness in the lines and in the, you know, and everything. So I do, I could see both sides of the argument actually. So I think that I prefer without pedal, but I've had friends and teachers that actually recommend using pedal just because, you know, the composer, if he would have known the piano really well, he would have wanted it smooth and connected. I actually think you can hear the different 
melodies better without the pedal because stuff gets smeared together when you use pedal. So the next part would be to play right hand the whole thing separately. playing this is you want to listen for the how that motive is being transformed, how is it modulating, um, all the different creative ways that Bach used to transform this simple motive, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this eight note motive. And that's what's really going to be the fun part because if you're just learning this just because you have to learn it, it's it's going to be like an exercise and you'll probably play it like an exercise and you don't want to do that. So my recommendation is to, it's like you have to kind of find the golden nuggets in this. And I didn't have a teacher back then that really explained things to me. It wasn't until I started really learning how these were created that I really started appreciating them. So when I teach to the inventions, I make it a big point to, you know, look at the structure, look at the motives. We, you know, we go through it meticulously, circle all the motives. How is it being transformed? How is it changing? Um, you know, what, because everything from this piece is derived from that motive, okay? Um, and it's just really amazing to see how he transformed this piece. Okay, so once you've done the right hand and then the left hand, uh, try adding the hands together. And this is a tricky part because you have two separate melody lines, right? This is, this is counterpoint. We're basically playing a melody in the right hand and playing an independent melody in the left hand. And you have to be able to have cohesiveness in both of those melodies. So practice it slowly. So again, I'm stopping at beat number one just to kind of remind myself that that's the end of phrases. Because there were not, there were no dynamics with the harpsichord, what did, you know, people do to kind of create more drama in the music? They would slow down the tempo, right? Because you can't play louder on a harpsichord. So I'm getting here close to the cadence, I'm going to slow down. basically to add the ornaments. So ornaments were added just because the sound did not carry on the harpsichord. So you have these extra flurries or little trills to kind of keep the sound alive while you're playing. So, um, and yeah, so these are added, you know, at the last. These are kind of like the, fi the finishing touches. And also another thing, uh, performers, players would, would kind of improvise on the ornaments. So you could add more ornaments if you wanted to, like at the very end, I actually pulled a chord. You could, you know, that was very common. It's like kind of improvising your own ornaments when you want to add them. Also just composers in general, pianists in general, or not pianists, but just uh, keyboard players would be able to improvise. And that's a skill that I feel like we've lost. So, um, yeah. So. Ornaments, uh, add that last, and from there, um, 
I think that's about it. I think that's that kind of wraps up how the kind of the, the general way of learning an invention. So let's try it. Also, another thing, you'll notice the motive doesn't start on beat number one, right? If it's one, two, three, four, one, right? It would kind of change the pulse of that motive. Instead, it starts on the E and uh, of one, one E and of one, right? So, so it's a different pulse, right? exaggerating the cadences just so you can kind of hear you know that's that's what you want to do you want to slow down on the invention if I, and that's how I'd recommend it if you were my student. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.